our next speaker is uh, Koos Fritsche from Octatube. So Koos has almost 10 years of experience as a structural and sales engineer at Octatube. Applying the structural design experience, he's passionate about the optimization of complex glass and steel structures, other oh, your, and developing innovative ways to meet client ambitions for challenging building envelopes. Most recent projects he has worked on are the C30 grid shell roof over the Shell Monumental courtyard, the tropical fruit warehouse standing facade with hanging glass fins, and the double curved blue lamp timber campus canopy with on site pen glass. Welcome. Also, apologies for the long intro. Um, I might go through quite fast, so maybe we have more time for lunch. Um, yeah, so my name is Koos Fritz. I work for Octatube. We are a design and build subcontractor from the Netherlands. And we stand for realizing challenging architects, and we like to be challenged. Uh, I was told not to make it into a sales pitch, which I usually do. So I'm going to skip a bit through, hopefully, the slides, if I can get this thing to work. Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, design and build, so realizing uh, the, uh, the architecture. So there's a, a design, it's not completely clear how it works, and we try to be the, the link between the architect uh, and in the end also build it. Uh, Smart selection of uh, recent jobs, so it's uh, a lot of steel and glass based. Uh, we do do timber, we do aluminium, we do different stuff. Um, but the one I want to talk to you about today is uh, the grid shell over the courtyard of the, the shell headquarters. It's called C30 uh, because of its number 30 in the in the building. Um, it's for Shell, which is uh, maybe from sustainability point of view uh, not uh, the best uh, client to name, but uh, they they do have a nice building and they wanted to upgrade it and make it future proof. Um, and we supply the paper uh, that describing that a short index uh, introduction, some of the engineering of the geometry. So we were involved quite early. So we did a lot of studying into how can you optimize the shape, how can you minimize materials. Uh, a bit of structural design. Uh, the focus on glass was the cold twisting. So we used uh, flat glass that we twisted into a curve on the side. Uh, a bit of theory about that and, and some pictures. Uh, production, which is primarily steel focus. I'll probably run through that a bit faster because uh, we're on the glass conference. Installation at some interesting points and uh, a short recap. Um, starting with the introduction, so uh, our client was Shell, uh, together with the main contractor Vries and Verburg, which is a local uh, Dutch contractor. Architect was Jacobs, uh, and it was around a thousand meter, a bit less uh, square uh, grid shell roof. Um, the building, so this is the building. Uh, it's from uh, 1915. This is the headquarters of Shell in the Netherlands in the Hague. Uh, there are two courtyards behind this facade. Uh, one of them, uh, both were open, and one of them was to be closed. Uh, this is a picture of what it looked like. So it's a listed building, uh, it all is monumental. The impact on the building had to be as little as possible. And of course, there were quite some restrictions in where it could go, uh, what kind of size it had to be, and how to connect uh, to a monumental building, which of course also has its uh, restrictions on the loading, etc., that you can take. Uh, or can place on it. It's a 30 by 30 meter uh, courtyard. Uh, it looks rectangular, but it is not, which makes it uh, quite more complicated than it uh, could have been if it was rectangular. And as you can see, there's these towers sticking through uh, the roof. So in the, in the top, in the, in the middle, you can see that. So it's actually interfering with the, uh, the edge beam, uh, also further complicating the structural scheme of this work. Uh, to press harder yeah uh, and the cross section so this is through the middle where it's actually a dome shaped but it, because of the edges are all flat which i will show you later on it actually is the 3d curved surface so it's not completely uh, a dome um, the engineering so as i said we were involved quite early stage for this project so there were a lot of uh, variants still being discussed so we proposed quite a bit of, uh, of alternatives. This is a short selection. We did, I think, around 30 different, completely different roofs. Uh, this was the, the short list, and in the end, the grid shell was chosen. As you can see in the bottom left, they actually chose for a more asymmetrical grid shell than in the end uh, they, uh, they wanted. So they, they first were looking around elevators as well, uh, interfering with the roof. Uh, this was all rationalized back to a more dome-shaped uh, roof. You also can see it with glass fins or even with the under uh, cable um, trusses, etc. 
So, uh, like I said, we did a lot of optimization. This is uh, done by uh, Grasshopper and Rhino. So we did a lot of parametric optimization of the shape. We had a certain height we could not uh, go above. Um, there had to be a certain division. Um, I think most of us in the room will have quite some uh, talks about uh, how Grasshopper works. So I won't dive in too much. Um, this landed with the Arstec's vision of the 1.6 by 1.6 uh, meter uh, frame division which as you can see is quite dense and originally on the top left you can see the shape that the, the roof was supposed to have uh, which was uh, very dynamic but not very efficient so it, it means that there was a lot of material not really uh, used to its maximum so we did quite some optimization into making it more transparent and really trying to find the balance between uh, the weight of the steel, so the sizes of the profiles, but also the sizes of the glass. So at what point does the glass pane become so big that it has to become thicker than is absolutely required, or the steel beams become thicker. So if you have bigger glass panes, you have bigger steel beams, there's a balance. Um, in the end, officially we came to a balance around 2.4 meters, but then the architect said, well, I want more transparency. So uh, we went a bit bigger, 2.6 by 2.6, uh, glaze and paints with, uh, with RHS profiles underneath, so that landed with this uh, geometry already shown, and a very short capping of the, um, the detailing. So if you see uh, the detailing, there's actually an RHS beam in there supporting the glass by very standard uh, RICO system is on there, there's a second waterway system in there, and it's actually cladded in aluminium with acoustic um, insulation to also contribute to the, to the comfort of the of the courtyard and also allowed to hide the sprinkler system that was running uh, through the roof. So on the left, the detailing on the right, there's the, I think this picture of the mock-up uh, still. Uh, the gutter, uh, some principles, I won't go in too deep. Uh, one of the complexities here is that the existing gutter that you can see on the top right has to be uh, maintained. So actually our edge beam is sitting above the original gutter and we made a new gutter towards the roof. It means it was quite tight, but also it means there were some asymmetrical forces on the supports. So actually supports were sticking out by an arm and then there was the edge beam, which gave quite some interesting um, support reactions and also reactions in the structural frame. As you can imagine, I also mentioned before, it is a monumental building, it's listed. Uh, it can take very little horizontal forces, so really the goods will have to stay together and work as a, as a contained unit. Uh, which is complicated by, you can see the holes in the, in the grid, so there's three towers sticking through, so also the edge beam was not continuous and we had to keep it together. Um, so what we did is we applied horizontal tension rods to keep the, the, sh the shell together and actually make moment fixed connections with the supports uh, while still sliding to keep the horizontal or the, the rotation of the edge beam under control. Um, and we played around with the supports. In the end, we made uh, supports all around it, but most, pretty much all of them, are only um, vertically supporting. So they're sliding in all directions. And only on four points, so there's the green circle, uh, and well, there should be another circle, but they were uh, fixed only in the direction of the, the walls, so in the length of the wall. So there would only be forces in the longitudinal direction and not perpendicular to the wall, pushing it out. That was where the cables were for. Uh, another complicating factor, this was uh, um, a, a roof over an existing courtyard, but underneath the courtyard there was an installation area and we could not support back through the crash deck to the installation area because it was very light flooring. So that meant we were not allowed to temporarily support the steel during installation and we had to find a way to install very big pieces of steel without putting any weight on the ground floor. Uh, or risk the chance that uh, the, either the floor would collapse or they would need a lot of reinforcements and, and additional foundation. So what we came with was the, I always pronounce this wrongly, re reciprocal, I believe it's called, uh, methodology where uh, the elements are actually supporting on each other. So on the top right you can see the green frames are around 20 meters, these are the longest frames prefabricated, hoisted in in one piece. It was spanning actually from the edge to the edge, and that center square, which was still around 20 to 20 meters, was filled with these yellow frames, which are supporting on each other, uh, making it very efficient and stable, but also meant it was insulation-wise quite a challenge, um, which I'll have some pictures of later in the presentation. Um, back to the subject we're here for, actually, uh, the glass. So, uh, as you can tell from the geometry, this was a double-curved surface uh, by 
segmented steel beams, all the edges were straight, but still the roof in itself had a double curvature. So we analyzed and we optimized also towards how much curvature can actually the glass take before it breaks. And then the intention was to bend this glass on site. So the flat glass panes were pushed on one corner on site into their shape. Um, on the left, you can see a bit of an overview from uh, Grasshopper and Rhino, where it shows the maximum deformations, uh, which was 126. We saw the pink ones around the, the perimeter, mainly on the right hand side. So quite, uh, quite some deformation on a 2.6 by 2.6 meter uh, panel. Um, a short recap of, uh, of glass and, and the boundary conditions uh, on the curving of glass. So I think everyone is familiar with the hot bending of the glass. So you uh, put a flat glass pane, you put it on a mold, you put it in the oven, pretty much heat it up. It sags into the shape you want, and then you can combine and you can uh, laminate them in some cases. Uh, and it allows you quite a lot of freedom in, uh, in sizes, but it is quite an expensive method. Uh, it takes time, it takes a lot of heat, um, and it also still has its restrictions. Uh, and the other type of bending which we applied here was a cold bending technique. So you see on the bottom right, this was a glass pane, which we, in essence, just put a loading on until it is the shape that we, uh, we want it to be. Um, making it far more cost efficient, making it also faster uh, to produce and also actually quite fast on site. Uh, but of course this has boundary conditions because you are applying a load already on the glass. It can take less wind loading, snow loading, etc. Um, and there's only so far that you can bend that piece of glass before it breaks. Um, then a bit on there's, there's two ways of bending a glass pane. So there's the twisting, which actually applied in this project where one point is pushed away from the three others. So three points are in one plane and one is pushed outwards, um, which gives a hyperbolical uh, shape. And then there's the curving, single curving of a pane, which you actually uh, bend it over a single axis. Uh, this is more widely used. The twisting uh, is also uh, another technique. And a bit of the differences uh, overview. So on the left, you can see the twisting. It gives a hyperbolic shape, as said, but also that means that the edges are staying straight. So you get flat edges, which is nice if you have a, a segmented steel frame. So you have all nice flat connections. You can use uh, proprietary waterways. Uh, and on the right, there's the bending, where also the edges, of course, curve with the whole pane. Um, it does mean that uh, it's more flat in the middle, so you can see on the bottom right, it doesn't sag as much in the other direction. Um, this is an example of a, a glass suction uh, machine that we have used uh, on uh, another project actually, but this is what we use for facades. So you can see here in the crane, this is a 5.5, 2.6 meter pane that is curved in the crane. So we pick up a flat pane and the motors on this glass suction device actually push in the edges, allowing us to uh, lift it up, push it in its size, put it against the facade, fix it, and then let go. We are quite a lot of testing uh, done with this. And also, as you can see, we can do asymmetrical bending as well, so this is only one, one part of the glass being, uh, being pushed. Um, this, of course, being a roof, uh, we actually did not need a machine. Uh, self-weight of the glass pane, due to its high self-weight, it already bends quite a bit. We only had to push it and give it a tiny nudge uh, to make it work. So on the left you can see the final element mo model representing this uh, with, with some tension on the, uh, on the loading. And of course it's important to note, uh, I forgot to mention it earlier, is that the, the speed and the temperature at which you cold bend this glass pane is also important. So if you ve go very quickly you have a higher chance of breaking it. If you go a bit slower uh, it works better and of course also the machine itself has some point loadings. It's quite a technical uh, uh, methodology but it works quite well. Uh, and actually, uh, it doesn't require that much force if you use it on the horizontal pane. So what I've marked up here in the green is actually the glass panes that were under self-weight already so, uh, so heavy and, and so flexible that they formed to the grid um, without us really pushing it. And that meant that we were able to um, install these glass panes without external clamping plates. So we could toggle them on the inner pane. Um, without having to protrude through the, the ceiling, which is usually the case, to keep the upper pane from popping off the, the glass. And the one around it are with, uh, with point fixing on the external. Um, production, I, I see I have uh, five minutes left, so I can run through this. 
uh, production was uh, done by an in-house developed uh, file to factory script. So we started from a grasshopper model, a line model. Uh, we feed it into the, the program and that makes uh, automatically all the beams and the connections. The frame division we had to input ourselves, but from there it was quite automatic. Uh, these assembly drawings uh, are made, so this is uh, the, the production frame. Um, in essence, it's, uh, it's struts. Uh, with uh, with rods on it, which you can align the, the grid, uh, the the nodes with. I'll have a picture of that in more detail later. Uh, like I said, file to factory. So each element had a number. Each element was unique. There's around 40, 450 beams in this one. 150 unique nodes. So everything is different. Uh, so all elements are bespoke, laser cut. Uh, here you can see that process. So the beams are cut into size into uh, slots. You can see some small extrusions on the beams. So they slotted into each other. Uh, quite nicely that it helped uh, setting the alignment for the insulation because as you can imagine building this roof needed quite a lot of um, uh, accuracy. Insulation frames, so this is the struts that we put a uh, steel rod on as you can see and then the beams connect onto that. We could set out the whole uh, frame, weld it and um, correct it for some sizes and, that's, and then it was ready actually. This is what it looked like in the workshop, so struts, um, steel production, big frames, uh, barely fit out of our uh, factory. So uh, that was quite a, quite a squeeze, but this is a 20 meter frame uh, going uh, for um, uh, zinc spraying and coating. Uh, Mock-up, just to give you a bit of the size uh, of, the, of the roof. And of course, insulation. So steel frames were hoisted in from, the, from street level. Um, like I said, the center part was built with a re reciprocal frame, but that meant that it was only stable after all the beams or all the frames were installed. So we actually needed two cranes, and we needed to do it in one day uh, to install them. So the first crane put in this first element, and then just hold it while the other frames were put around it. So we installed all four frames in one day, um, which in the end was stable. So you can see on the top left, or on the left, that it's uh, all, uh, all connected up. Uh, end of day, so we're quite happy because if that were, didn't work out, we had to pull them all out again uh, before end of the day. Otherwise, uh, we couldn't temporarily keep them in. Uh, and glass installation, of course, also had quite some restrictions. Um, Shell has quite some high uh, safety requirements, as they should, I suppose, uh, being uh, also with a lot of oil uh, rigs. Um, we were not allowed to hoist over this roof uh, during office hours, or pretty much. Uh, the entire week. So instead we had some slots in which we could uh, hoist over these roofs around it. We made a scaffold, a temporary scaffold, on the top of the grid shell. You can see on the right panel, I hope it's clear, on which we loaded our, our glass um, stillages and we installed from there, uh, avoiding to hoist over the roof all the time. It also made it quite a lot faster. And the final panels, of course, uh, had to be done. Uh, these are the center panels coming in. Um, conclusion, uh, this is the final uh, image, uh, they were still doing the, the ground works. Um, you can see that the cables uh, are in there, but they are not very noticeable uh, in, in our opinion. Uh, and it turned out uh, very nicely, we're quite proud of this job. Uh, here you can see the, the glass uh, corners, um, you can see the clamping uh, plates uh, on the corners actually. Um, and I think I had another, oh yeah, uh, final picture in, in which you can see the geometry of the, of the roof uh, with safety lines, etc. running over. Um, ah, in time. That's it. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed it, could follow everything. If any questions, uh, please let me know.